Welcome to A Flame for Christ, homilies and talks to set your heart on fire with love for Jesus Christ. My name is Father Joseph Gill, a priest of the Diocese and of Bridgeport, Connecticut, and you've joined us as we begin talking about spiritual warfare, part one. So when talking about spiritual warfare, a lot of people want me to talk about possession. And possession is one way in which the evil one does sometimes afflict and impact human beings. However, possession is rather rare, and it's something that most of us listening to this talk will never, ever experience. So I'm not going to focus a lot on possession. In fact, Father Gabriel Amorth, the Vatican's top exorcist, who did over 10,000 exorcisms in his life before he died recently, he said there was only three ways in which someone can be possessed. The first way is if they invite Satan in by doing something like a Ouija board or tarot cards or, uh, you know, consecrating themselves to Satan. And that's not altogether that common. You know, the movie The Exorcist, which is based on a true story. Uh, in the real story, it was a boy, not a girl, uh, based out of Georgetown, Maryland. And he actually did get possessed by using the Ouija board. So yes, those satanic things, those occult uh, things can actually be a, a, an invitation for Satan to come into our life. A second way in which we can get possessed is through, um, through having someone with spiritual authority over us invoke a curse upon us. That is a possibility if perhaps a grandfather curses their grandchildren for whatever reason. And sometimes that happens, but again, that's pretty rare. A third way in which possession could happen is if someone lives in the state of unrepentant mortal sin. That is if, you know, for example, I've, I met one man who I believe was possessed. He was uh, in a gang and he had committed many murders and was not sorry for them. He said he had to do it as part of his gang life. So that could be very well an avenue for Satan to come and possess a soul. Yet, nevertheless, that's pretty rare. And so most of the people listening here have not experienced that. So more of what I want to talk on today is temptation. How do we overcome it? What are the sources of temptation? And what are the tools that God has given us to overcome these temptations in our life? So let's talk about that. First of all, though, we have to take a step back and realize that we are in the midst of a spiritual war. In fact, St. Maximilian Kolbe had a great quote. He said, The battleground between God and Satan is the human soul. God desperately wants your soul. In fact, he will do anything to have your soul be with him for all eternity. He would rather die on a cross than suffer eternity without you. And so that's how desperately our Lord desperately wants your soul to be living with him forever. But Satan also wants your soul. He wants your soul so much that he would rather endure all the torments of hell than give up the possibility of your soul. And so there's this war going on between Satan and God. Now, of course, we know that God is ultimately far more powerful, but the challenge with this war is that we get to decide who wins. You know, there's a great story that comes from uh, the Native American culture where this old brave was speaking to a young warrior. And the old man was talking about how in every soul there's two wolves, a good wolf and a bad wolf. And the two of them are fighting back and forth. And the young brave says, well, who wins the battle? And the old man said, whichever one you feed, whichever one you feed. So yes, there's a battle between God and Satan, and we get to choose who's going to win that battle, who's, who our soul is going to belong to, because our soul does not ultimately belong to us. So either going to be marked with the sign of Jesus Christ, the sign of the cross, which we've received at baptism, and hopefully we live out and keep alive through the state of grace, or it's going to be darkened. God's grace is going to be absent of it, and it'll be lost for all eternity. So we live in a world at war. We cannot try to gloss over that or whitewash it. In fact, Jesus says himself, I come not to bring peace, but the sword, because he came on a rescue mission for our souls. It's interesting if you go to John's gospel. So John the apostle talks about uh, different levels of people that are connected with Christ. You know, he talks about, there's of course the apostles, those 12 who are so intimately connected with him. Then there's the disciples, the people that follow him, that, that love him, but are not part of the intimate 12. Then we've got the crowd, People who follow him for all sorts of different reasons. They follow him because of the miracles he taught. Because they, they, they did. He's taught, they follow him because of his great teachings. But ultimately, these are people who have no personal commitment to Christ. They simply follow him just because of some of the ancillary benefits. But then there's the world. And in John's gospel, the world is shorthand for all those forces who are opposed to Christ. And at the very end of John's gospel, when Jesus is giving his final uh, Last Supper discourse, he says something very interesting. He says, now is the ruler of this world cast out. Well, who's the ruler of this world? According to St. John, it's Satan. It's not God. 
Because Jesus says later on that his kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. So this world initially was ours. God created it and gave it to the first man and the first woman. And he gave us this world with the instructions, have dominion over the world, subdue it. This is your territory. Rule it in my name. But then we gave away our authority when we were tricked, when we were lied to by Satan, and we bit that lie, quite literally, in in eating that original fruit, falling into that original sin. So we gave away the authority that should have been ours to rule the earth in God's name. We gave that away to Satan. So Satan is now kind of, in, in a sense, very much the king of this world, very much the ruler of the earthly and the principalities of the earth, which is why we now live in a battlefield. Because Christ came to try to break free of that bondage, to try to liberate us from the tyranny of Satan who already rules this world. But that fight between God and Satan is going to last to the end of time. Of course, we know who wins. We know that in the end, Jesus Christ is victorious. But we're still fighting the battle for our own souls and our own eternal destinies. So how do we, so what are some of the tricks that the devil tries to get us to fight on his side? Well, there are three sources of temptation according to Catholic theology. And the three sources are the world, the flesh, and the devil. Let's take a look at each of those three sources of temptation and see how they were lived out and how we can kind of see them in our own life and in the life of Christ. So first, the most important and the most deadly one is the temptation of the devil. Now, I'm not talking about hearing voices saying, oh, do this, steal that cookie, or do this, you know, that's not what the temptation of the devil is. What was the devil's main sin? Ultimately, it was pride. Pride is the devil's main sin, right? He had this famous motto, non servium, I will not serve, because the devil wanted to be like God. And of course, he was fought by St. Michael, the archangel, and Michael's name means, who is like God? In other words, there is no one like God. And yet the devil had the pride, the arrogance of wanting to be like God. Now, how is that lived out in our own life? Because I don't think most people would say, oh, I'm God. Well, it's lived out in a couple of ways. First of all, If we don't pray and we don't have a serious relationship with Christ, that's a way in which we say, you know what? I can do this life thing on my own. I don't need anybody. I don't need God. I can do it all by myself. Another one is thinking that humanity or technology is going to solve all the problems in the world. You know, back when the COVID epidemic uh, was just finally starting to come down, the cases were coming down right out as the lockdown was closing. And especially in New York, a lot of the cases were coming down. The governor of New York got up on national television and said something rather shocking. He said, God did not do this. We did this. Science did this. God did not do this. I was absolutely flabbergasted when he said that God did not do this because it's almost putting ourselves in science as a rival to God and saying, you know what? Our prayers are worthless. Our our worship of God is worthless. The only thing we need to do is just have more scientific discoveries and we're going to find the, the way to true happiness, even perhaps the way to live forever. Well, of course, that's the ancient temptation. What was the temptation of the Adam and Eve? It was, if you eat this apple, you will become like God. And that's the temptation sometimes of our own pride and arrogance is to think I'm like God. Another way in which this temptation is lived out is people who say, oh, I don't believe what the church teaches about X. You know, all the time I have conversations with my parishioners who say, oh, yeah, you know, I'm a good Catholic, but I'm pro-choice. I'm a good Catholic, but I believe in, in gay marriage. Well, the truth is you can't be a good Catholic and believe in these things because that ultimately makes ourselves the Pope. That means that we get to decide what is right and what is wrong. Forget what the church teaches. Forget what Jesus Christ teaches in the scriptures. We get to decide. Well, that is that insidious pride, that arrogance of thinking that we are the arbiters of right and wrong. So the first temptation is that temptation of pride. And that's kind of the most deadly one. A second temptation. So we got the world, the flesh, and the devil. Let's look at the world. Now, is the world bad? It's not bad in and of itself. But the world becomes bad when we make riches and power and popularity our God. That's the people that their entire life is really focused around just working and making as much money as possible, buying expensive clothes, expensive cars, whatever it is, not giving generously to the poor, to good charities, to the church. It's that kind of worldliness of just making our life really centered around the things of this earth. A a perfect example here in our culture is what we call the American dream, right? American dream is make as much money as you possibly can and spend it all on yourself. That is the temptation of the world. 
I want to share with you one of my favorite saints who really, really kind of lived out that temptation in her early part of her life. Her name was Saint Hyacintha Mariscotti, and perhaps I like her because she sounds like an Italian dessert. I'm not sure. But Hyacintha Mariscotti was from the late 1500s. She grew up as a daughter of a noble family, and so she had lots of wealth. She used it all on herself, having the finest gowns, basically going out and partying all the time, being a socialite, just basically kind of living the, uh, the Jane Austen lifestyle of going from party to party, gossiping about boys, flirting with all of them, spending her time on beauty and whatnot. And that was her entire life. Now, when she was about 17, she had her eye on this one specific young man from her village. And she said, that's the guy. That's the one I want to marry. He's good looking. He's wealthy. He can provide me with a great life. You know, let's go. And so the young man showed interest in her. The young man would come over to the family house, help around with chores, come over for Sunday dinner. And finally, after kind of courting her for quite some time, the young man went in one day with the parents to presumably ask for her hand in marriage. And after this brief meeting, the parents and the young man come out and the parents announce to the whole family, we have wonderful news. This young man wants to marry your younger sister. Well, Hyacintha was crushed. She thought, there's no way for me to recover from this. My life is over. All of my dreams and hopes were in this one young man. And if he's not interested in me, my life is, is done. I'm just going to go join the convent. And so that's what she did. But even in joining the convent, she joined it for all the wrong reasons. And in those days, you had to make your own habit, which is what the nuns wear. And so she made her habit out of the finest silk that money could buy. Instead of fasting, she had her friends sneak her in food so she wouldn't have to go hungry. And while the nuns were at prayer, she would sneak off the convent grounds and go and meet up with her former friends. And so she lived a life completely steeped in the world, despite being officially a nun. So what ended up happening was that she got very sick to the point that they thought that she was going to die. And so they called in a priest to give her the last sacraments. And when the priest walked into the room and saw the fancy habit that she was wearing and the stash of food in the corner, the priest was shocked and said, Sister Hyacintha, consider... If you continue down this path, you're going to go to hell. Well, Hyacintha was shocked. She kind of never really considered her eternal salvation. And she vowed at that moment that if the Lord granted her to survive this illness, she would change her life completely. So, thanks be to God, she did recover from that illness. She got better. And when she left that, uh, that sick room, she gave away her expensive uh, silken habit and made one out of the roughest cloth. She gave away the food and she started spending long hours in prayer and penance. And so from this worldly young lady, she ended up becoming a great saint. But that's the second temptation, is that the world, the things of the world, the riches and the power, all become something that's very attractive to us and that we make that our God. Finally, the third source of temptation is the flesh. The flesh, pleasure, wanting the pleasures of the body. Now again, is the body bad? Is pleasure bad? No, not necessarily, when it's used in the right way. However, a lot of times with this temptation is that we want to use pleasure in the wrong way. I can think, for example, of uh, an all-you-can-eat buffet. I don't know if you've ever been to one. I certainly hope you have. It's a wonderful experience. And there was one near where I was growing up called Golden Corral, which is so appropriately named because it really is like a feeding trough for humans. And you go there and you fill up a plate and you eat it, you fill up another plate and another plate until you have seven empty plates on your, your table. And your buttons are literally popping off your shirt. You're so stuffed. I mean, you're, in, you're moaning in pain. But then if you're like me, you look up and you see the pie table. And you think to yourself, oh no, I haven't been to the pie table yet. I have to go to the pie table. But you know that if you go to the pie table, it's going to hurt. You're going to feel physical pain. Your guts may literally spill out on the sidewalk. And yet what do we do? We get up and we go to the pie table. And so that desire for pleasure ends up causing us pain in the long run. And there's something that happened because of original sin that we call concupiscence. Concupiscence basically means having disordered desires, desiring things that we know are harmful to us. For example, all of us rationally know that smoking is harmful to us, and yet some people do it anyway. All of us know that sleeping too much and being lazy is going to be harmful to us or eating too many potato chips or whatever it is. The physical desires of the flesh are going to be harmful to us. And yet we do it anyway because we have this weakness of the flesh that makes the flesh want to have mastery over our free will. And so many of the saints even struggled with that. I think of this great example of St. Augustine. You know, St. Augustine, before his conversion, prayed a very famous prayer, Lord, give me purity, but not yet. Give me purity, but not yet. 
he was too engaged in the physical lust of, of illicit sexuality to not want to give that up. He was so steeped in his sin. And so those are the three sources of temptation. We've got the world, the flesh, and the devil. And these correspond exactly to three things. So, so first, uh, to the, the, first of all, to the three temptations of Christ. So for example, what was the first temptation? The devil said to Jesus, turn these stones into bread. Now again, is it bad to turn stones into bread if you're hungry? No. But what was Jesus supposed to be doing at that time? Fasting. So the temptations of the flesh then overcame or were trying to uh, speak to that desires of the flesh, the, the natural desires we have, but they're used in the wrong way. The second temptation Jesus faced was he took him up to the top of the uh, uh, high mountain and showed him all the riches of the world, the glories of the kingdoms, and said, you can have all of this. So again, it's taking these good things that God has created, riches, diamonds, gold, wealth, and in making that instead an idol. Because what did he have to do in order to get all of that? The devil said, you can have all this if you bow down and worship me. And that's the key. Is that, yeah, okay, you can have all this stuff, but only if you sell your soul and give away the one thing that's really truly valuable in the end, which is your eternal salvation. But then finally, the temptation was to throw yourself down from the temple. Now, this is a really strange temptation because we look at that and we say, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, we're basically, by throwing ourselves down from the temple, we are saying, God, you have to do my will. I want you to save me and you're going to do it because I'm going to tell you to do it. And that's that temptation of pride of saying, God, you have to do my will rather than saying, Lord, I will do your will. And so we see those three temptations of Christ corresponding with these three sources of of temptation, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Even if you go all the way back to Adam and Eve, it says that Eve took a look at that apple and saw that it was delightful to the eyes, temptations of the world. It was good to the taste. It was good for eating, desires of the flesh. And that it was desirable for gaining wisdom, the wanting to know things, the wanting to have that kind of supernatural knowledge of arrogance and pride. So even all the way back at the beginning, we see those three sources of temptation, the world, the flesh, and the devil. So how can we overcome these temptations? Stay tuned for part two of Spiritual Warfare, where we're going to talk about how to overcome these three temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil, talk about the three gates that we have to guard, and then we'll talk about the other ways in which Satan can influence our life. Stay tuned. 